Dr. Paul Nelson is a philosopher of biology and graduate program associate professor of science and religion at Biola University. He is an evolutionary theory PhD from the University of Chicago and widely published author. In the next 40 minutes or so, I want to explain to you why textbook evolutionary theory, neo-Darwinian theory, does not account for the origin of animal form, which is something, after all, we would want in evolutionary theory to do. Uh, I think that many people, both lay people and scientists, have the sense that Darwin solved that problem, that Darwin told us where animals came from in all their diversity, and that there are only a handful of puzzles remaining, like the origin of life, but basically, animal form was taken care of by the origin of species and subsequent developments in evolutionary theory. Well, as I'll show you in the next half hour, 40 minutes, that's not so. And it's not so for a very interesting reason. The requirements of neo-Darwinian theory itself, namely the theory of natural selection, put strict limits on what is possible in, in terms of transforming animal shapes. Now, think about what it means to be a vertebrate. You are all vertebrates. Actually, you're all chordates. Our phylum, chordata, has certain characteristic features that are architectural. As the name implies, the main one is that we have a dorsal nerve cord. In our case, we have more than that, but we have at least a dorsal nerve cord. We have paired appendages. We have certain features that put us within that large architecture, and lots of different animals fall into that group, the phylum chordata. This worm doesn't have that architecture. It's a nematode. It falls into a different sort of architecture and a different phylum. Fruit flies fall into yet another phylum, arthropods. And then we have the purple sea urchin, which is an echinoderm with five-fold symmetry, falling into yet another group. So that's what we're going to look at. How did these basic architectural differences come to be? I should stress to you that I am not challenging the reality of natural selection. It actually happens, and we have many examples of it in biology. What we're going to look at is, you know, given these conditions, does this process explain the origin of animal form? So the first condition is variation. You need to have differences within a population, wherever they may be, from the molecular level all the way up to the behavioral. So here are some differences among tigers. Uh, just in terms of their coat color and the expression of the genes involved in, in, in building that coat color. They're all within that particular group, but you can see there's variation there. Here are differences among stickleback fishes from a population in, I believe, Scotland. Again, all within the same species, but you can see there are differences between those fishes in terms of their anatomical traits. <coughs> Excuse me. Or ladybugs. Just look around this room and you'll see a tremendous amount of variation strictly within our species, Homo sapiens. It's what, one of the things that makes our species so interesting. Now the question is, will that variation make a difference to the number of offspring that you leave in that population? If it does, if some trait that you possess makes a difference to the number of offspring you produce, and that trait can be transmitted from you to your offspring. Over time, if that difference in production of offspring continues, the population as a whole will shift over time. So here's a little cartoon of a very simple single-celled, let's say this is like yeast or some single-celled eukaryote, and we have an orange trait and a yellow trait present in the population. So there's some variation in that particular trait. And we introduce a selective condition. That's the black bar running across the screen there. Now, let's say the black bar favors the yellow trait, whatever it happens to be, over the orange trait. And we maintain that selective condition. We keep it, in, you know, keep it there in the presence of that population, and we let the engines of variation and selection run. Over time, there'll be a shift in that population as a whole. Now, what you see here is that the yellow trait has come entirely to dominate the population. The orange trait is gone. There's a demographic shift in that population over time. That is the operation of natural selection. Now, 
There's a third condition that's very important for what we're going to look at when we come to the origin of animal form. You've got to be able to transmit that variation to the next generation. If you can't, if the variation is too destructive to be transmitted, it cannot provide the raw materials for natural selection. Bottom line, if you cannot transmit your variations to the next generation, you are a dead end as far as evolution is concerned. It's an important point, we'll come back to it when we get to the origin of animal form. Now, this is not nice to talk about because this next point I'm going to make actually criticizes the evolutionary biology community and I try to avoid doing that because I interact a lot with members of the evolutionary biology community. I go to professional meetings and so forth. But one of the problems with natural selection, at least as it's presented for popular consumption, is actual case studies of the process in action for things like animal form or complex structures. I'm not talking about antibiotic resistance here or resistance to heavy metals that you might see in a plant near a, 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 um, a mine site, for instance. I'm talking about major kinds of changes in animal form and function. Those claims are rarely, if ever, backed up with evidence. It's really shameful when you think about it. And I can tell you how you can verify this for yourself. Pick a complex system, let's say like uh, the origin of the vertebrate digestive system. Go to the biological literature and try to find the step-by-step -step scenario by which that feature arose from random variation and natural selection. And I can tell you what you will find. Nothing. Now, skepticism about the adequate of textbook theory to explain that kind of transition is widespread within evolutionary biology. Again, this is not something that's well known to the lay public, but if you go into the primary literature and read papers by scientists trying to solve the problem, you will see them expressing sentiments like this. Wallace Arthur is a geneticist in the UK. I met him when I was a graduate student at Chicago. He came there to do a sabbatical. And in the late 1980s, he was becoming very dissatisfied with standard theory. In this publication, he said, we don't really know how body plans arise. Uh, he said, there's no direct evidence for a Darwinian origin of a body plan. This kind of skepticism, as I said, is widespread. So coming towards the present, Eric Davidson at Caltech in a paper in 2006 said, what we see in small-scale evolution the kinds of things we see, for instance, in moth populations or in fruit fry populations or the well-studied populations that we would look at in a classical genetics course cannot be taken as models for the evolution of body plants. These are like apples and oranges. So again, he's making this qualitative distinction between small-scale and large-scale evolution and saying there's some important difference there that we're failing to grasp. Now, if you go back in the history of evolutionary theory, to the foundation of neo-Darwinism itself, you can find the point at which the mistake was made. Now, I hesitate to call it a mistake because science is a way of organizing your mistakes, and you cannot do science without running the risk of being wrong. And ag again, I do not want to denigrate evolutionary biology. It's hard to get everything right, and you have to make assumptions, many of which will turn out to be wrong, but that's how science moves forward. So please bracket mistake with scare quotes. An assumption was made by the founders of neo-Darwinian theory about how to understand evolution. And you can see the assumption here laid out in one of the founding documents of the neo-Darwinian synthesis. 1937, Theodosius Dobzhansky's classic text, Genetics and the Origin of Species, which my mentors at Chicago would have read as students learning evolutionary theory, and I read it myself as a student of evolution. Early in the book, so this is page 12, he's laying out his program here, Dobzhansky says, if we want to understand macroevolution, we require time on a geological scale. Well, we don't have access to that. We don't have access to tens and hundreds of millions of years of time over which these changes took place. So how are we going to study evolution? He says we've got to extrapolate. We've got to take what we can study, namely microevolution, those processes that we can observe within a human lifetime and control, and extend them by extrapolation over time 
and we'll assume that the processes of microevolution will scale to macroevolution just given enough time. So that's the assumption. Micro scales to macro, just provide enough variation and enough time, and transformation is inevitable. The important claim here is that the raw materials for evolution are all the same. They're all micro, they're all small-scale differences. Now that assumption has turned out to be false. And it's been discovered to be false by evolutionary biologists themselves. In fact, it's been given a name, the Great Darwinian Paradox. That name was given by a geneticist at Georgia Tech. At the time, actually, he was at the University of Georgia, John McDonald. And he said, the last 20 years of research on the genetic, base of genetic basis of adaptation, which is what we're talking about today, has led us to what he calls this great Darwinian paradox. The paradox arises at the intersection of three ways of thinking about animal diversity. The first is how animals develop. So this circle represents all the knowledge that we've accumulated about how animals develop from a single cell, the fertilized egg, to the adult. But we can couple that knowledge with the theory of common descent, the theory that all animals are related in a great tree, going back to some original parent, and the theory of natural selection. So these three parts of biological understanding come together to create this paradox right here at the point of intersection. What we know about development, what the theory of common descent requires, and what natural selection as a causal process requires. So that's where the paradox is going to pop up, right where those three circles come together. And it can be represented, excuse me, as a three-point argument. Drawing on each of those three parts of biological understanding. So the first part of the paradox, the first part of the argument, comes from what we know about development. Most, not all, but most animals, nearly all, begin their life as a single cell, a fertilized egg. Well, natural selection tells us if you're going to change the form of any animal, you've got to start early because that's where the form is put in place. You have to have mutations. They've got to be viable. In other words, they can't destroy the organism, and they've got to be transmitted to your offspring. So these are requirements put in place by common descent and natural selection. Now the paradox occurs. Those are the very mutations that are least likely to be tolerated by the embryo. And we know this clearly from the last hundred years of developmental biology. If you want to destroy a developing embryo, induce a mutation that's expressed early that affects the formation of the body plan. This, in fact, was discovered in fruit flies, and it led to a Nobel Prize for Christiana Nusslein Folhard and Eric Wieschaus in 1995. Because in the late 1970s, working with fruit flies, they systematically perturbed the genetics of Drosophila. Thousands and thousands and thousands of mutations, putting the question to the fruit flies, what do you need to exist at all? By the way, where, the, where they were working turned out to be this intersection, and that's why their discoveries are so relevant to the paradox. But here's what they did. It was kind of a form of reverse engineering, if you will. Disrupt a gene in Drosophila, and hence its protein product, and then ask the fly, can you still develop to a normal adult? So there's a fruit fly. My wife and I had an infestation this summer. We had some overripe bananas, and they're, they're actually very beautiful. They have brilliant red eyes, but they're pests, you know. <laughs> There were a lot of them in the kitchen, let me tell you. So there's our starting point, the fertilized egg. And what happens is from that point, in normal development, there is a cascading series of decisions. As the cell number goes up from one to many millions present here in the adult, and as that fly egg divides, Actually, cell division occurs relatively late in Drosophila. There's a lot of other stuff going on first. Anyway, as development unfolds, you get this increasing differentiation and specialization of cell types that has probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of individual relevant decisions. As a, as a tissue is being committed, let's say, to be a limb or a sense organ or part of the gut or part of the reproductive cells, 
again leading over here. And what Nussline, Fohart, and Wieschaus did is they induced mutations at different points in this process and asked, what are the consequences downstream if we induce a mutation at this point? Now, what they found was remarkable. This is a little biological detail, perhaps more than you expected on a Saturday afternoon, but I'll explain what's going on here. We have four columns, and in the left-hand portion of each column is a picture, a cartoon of the normal form of the larva. Now, uh, fruit flies go through what's called holometabolous metamorphosis, where they have a stage that's like a little maggot. You've all seen fly maggots. Drosophila maggots are very small, but you can easily see them under a low-powered microscope. And this is what they look like here in these left-hand columns. These are the maggot forms. They're, they'll transform later into the adult fly. Uh, but the areas that are colored in pink here, you see those regions colored in pink? Those are the parts of the larva that will be affected by the mutations that Nussline, Fohart, and Wieschaus induced. Now, the right-hand columns show the mutant forms. These are the mutant larva. And what's true of all of them? They're all dead. They're not going anywhere. Uh, in some cases, they're enormously truncated. They've lost all these sections here. This mutant's embryo, you can recover it in a, in a fruit fly experiment, but it's, it's dead. It's stone dead. It's not going anywhere. Because they were able to induce these very uh, catastrophic early acting mutations, they could reverse engineer the whole process. Because they could see, well, we know that in order to have these sections in the normal form, there's some mutant gene in this product or, or this embryonic lethal that is required to build the normal form. And you can see you break it enough, if you break the embryo in enough different ways, you can figure out what it needs to exist at all. And that's what they did. It was really reverse engineering. And it's not hard to see why these mutations are lethal. It depends on the logic of development. Notice that there's, a, there's an asymmetry here that's fundamental. One cell here, lots of cells here, and a causal trajectory connecting them. What that means is that events that happen here carry an overwhelming responsibility with respect to everything downstream. So here's a way to think about it that I think you can grasp easily. Let's say you have a mutation that's expressed very late. So most of the fruit fly has been put in place. The body plan has been put in place at this point. A mutation that's expressed here might well be viable. Let's say it affects just the wing venation or the number of bristles on the fly. But pretty much everything about the rest of the fly is where it should be. So we have a mutation that's expressed late, and it affects just that group of cells there. You might still get a viable fly out of that. A mutation back here, though, that's likely to be catastrophic because the downstream cells that it will affect are going to be much, much greater in number and more global in consequence for the normal fly. So boom, thousands and millions of cells are affected. And the, given that it's a random mutation, the likelihood that you'll crash the whole system goes way up. So the severity of the mutations tends to increase the earlier they're expressed, just because of the logic of development. And you can see this looking at fruit fly normal development. Here's that single cell that I described for you a moment ago. This is now the fertilized egg. It's one big cell. And gradients are set up within that space that will specify this banding pattern that will eventually give you the larval form. Well, a mutation here that affects this banding, excuse me, that affects the expression of this gradient will crash the whole system. And in fact, that's how those regulators were discovered, because they brought the whole thing down. This is quite general. It doesn't exist. This pattern of early disastrous, later maybe not so bad, can be seen in all kinds of different model systems in developmental biology, like C. elegans, that worm that I showed you a few minutes ago. With C. elegans, its whole cell lineage has been worked out. In fact, this is also Nobel Prize winning research. John Sulston and his co-workers in the United Kingdom sat at microscopes and watched those worms develop. So here's the fertilized egg, and they traced the lineage of every single cell leading to the adult. 
Now, I would never have the patience to do this. I barely had the patience to make this PowerPoint. <laughs> but I'll tell you something that Discovery is doing that I hope sometime midsummer you will go to YouTube and watch. We are setting this whole cell lineage to a Bach cantata. And you'll be able to watch the whole thing in three and a half minutes. And if, if it all works out the way I hope, it'll take your breath away. But John Sulston sat there, and he watched this unfolding pattern. So here's our starting cell. It divides to two daughters. They themselves divide. Right here, coming off here, this P lineage, that's going to be, those will be the cells that will give rise to the eggs and sperm of the next generation. And notice they're segregated right away from the rest of the organism because this is carrying the instructions. This cell lineage is carrying the instructions for the next generation. Now, here's a different way of looking at it. Same picture, but you can see these cell lineages already know where they're going. Uh, you're going to have muscle, pharynx, nervous system, and so forth. You can take a laser, because the C. elegans uh, egg case is transparent, you can take a laser and knock out these individual lineages and watch what happens. And you crash the system. These Developing embryos have a certain range of variation that they will tolerate and a whole bunch of other variation that they will not. That constrains what's possible for evolution because, remember, the logic of natural selection itself says if you can't pass a variation on to the next generation, it's invisible to natural selection. It cannot be the raw materials for evolution. Here's the problem. The variations required for macroevolution are enormously destructive to animals. So we've got this fundamental paradox. The variation that we see is not relevant to macroevolution. The variation that would be relevant to macroevolution is enormously destructive. We don't see it. Ann Gager at Discovery and Biologic Institute and I have compared this to a magic bridge. This would be right at home in any Indiana Jones movie. It's magic in the following sense. You start here on the left, and you walk out on the bridge, and as long as you keep moving, keep walking, towards the other side, the bridge will be there beneath your feet. The minute you stop or turn around or you know, pause to look over the edge, the bridge disappears, and you plunge into the chasm. Now, animal development is very much like that. Once that egg begins to divide, it has a distant trajectory or a target excuse me, a distant target that's connected by a trajectory that it must reach to be viable. You can actually prove this for yourself by taking, let's say, uh, a sea urchin embryo uh, in solution or in a culture, watch it divide, and put in a chemical that will arrest mitosis, that will stop cells from dividing. That embryo is going to be very unhappy because in fact, it will die because the embryo itself is only a way station somewhere here on the bridge leading towards the adult form. Human development is certainly like this. In fact, our development continues long after we're born. Arguably, humans develop until sexual maturity, which is you know, early teens, mid-teens for most humans. We have a long way to go across that bridge before we can reproduce. But reproductive capability is way over here on the other side. Now, think about this with relation to natural selection. One of the essential conditions of natural selection, being able to make copies of yourself, is way over here. So how did natural selection put in place this whole bridge of development when one of its essential conditions is on the far side? This problem has never been solved by evolution, and it arises from the logic of development itself. And the requirements of natural selection. So what we're doing here is we're being very strict evolutionary biologists in saying, what does natural selection itself require? When we apply this difficulty to the origin of the animals, the same problem recurs. If Urbilateria actually existed, it probably had a few thousand cells, and the same problem would exist. To, to change this into something that it's not, into a mollusk, or into a chordate, or into a brachiopod, or some other kind of creature, would require disrupting its normal development somewhere back here, and you'd crash the system. So, I should wrap up and leave plenty of time for questions. <laughs>
This problem, as I told you earlier, is well understood within evolutionary theory. John McDonald, in this paper that I read as a student, put it this way. Now, this is some technical language from evolutionary theory. I'll translate it for you. What he's saying is, the genes that vary within natural populations do not seem to lie at the basis of major adaptive changes, as you would want for the origin of a new body plan. Those genes that would do that apparently are not variable within natural populations. Not for any spooky or mystical reason, it's that you can't vary those fundamental elements. The architectural requirements of a body plan, let's say in a fruit fly, tell you, if I'm going to exist at all, I need three body segments, six legs, a gut, a nervous system, and so forth. Those are non-negotiable features of what it means to be a fruit fly. What it means to be homo sapiens is to have a brain stem, is to have a circulatory system and some skeletal system to support that. There are certain features of your, bi of your biology which cannot vary. If they do, you cease to be. Eric Davidson, two years ago, and he's continued on this theme in his work, has said neo-Darwinian theory is based on assumptions that are counterfactual. And he says it gives rise to lethal errors. This is textbook evolutionary biology now that he's criticizing not for reasons related to the intelligent design controversy, because Eric Davidson is a strong opponent of intelligent design. Rather, he's saying, I cannot make textbook theory work to explain where animals came from, which, after all, is what I want to do. All right, we've got 15 minutes for questions, and I'll stop here. I have a few more slides, but I'd rather hear from you. Thank you for being so attentive. To view this program again and share it with your friends, and to learn more about this series, these conferences, and the intersection of science and faith, please go to www.pensmore.org. The proceeding was brought to you by the Pensmore Foundation and NRB-TV.